Good morning and welcome. We are glad that you're here today. He is risen. Amen. That's for, for, a, for, a, for a, a, a boy who was raised on a dirt farm to hear he is risen, he is risen indeed, to, to see life spring forth out of, out of dirt growing up, to see life springing forth out of the trees and the grass and the things that we have going on now. Just this time of the year is exciting for me. This time of the year, I get to see God, God's hand at work. Not that we don't see it at other times, but in particular, you get to see it now. And then we come together to celebrate Easter. And in this entire story, we're going to see God's hand at work. We're going to see God at work throughout history, raising up new life out of our old dead ones. We're going to see him raising up new life out of a son who was crucified. When Jesus was on earth, he raised four people from the dead. Quite a feat, don't you think? Anybody in here ever raised anybody from the dead? No, not me. Now, we, we used to have a member who had been raised from the dead, Charles Wyatt, who is no longer with us. He is dead, dead now, and he's gone to heaven. He's waiting on us. He'll be there meeting us at the gate saying, what took you guys so long? But Jesus in his life raised four people from the dead. He raised the widow's son in the village of Nain over in Luke chapter 7. He raised a 12-year-old daughter of Jairus over in Mark chapter 5. He raised Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha in Bethany, after he had been dead for four days. And we find that story in John chapter 11. Can you guess the final person that he raised from the dead? Himself! Here. He raised himself after he'd been crucified. You know, that always, that, that struck me when I was studying that this week. That he had been given the power to raise himself. Now, it's true in the New Testament. It teaches that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 tells us that. Acts chapter 2, verse 32 tells us that. But it's also true that Jesus himself was acting to bring about his own resurrection. In John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus would say this, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And he doesn't stop there. He says, I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. God the Father gave Jesus the authority to take up his life again from the grave where his body had been laid. Again, in John chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father has given all judgment to the Son. So the Son has authority to raise from the dead whomever he will, including himself. In John chapter 2, verse 9, destroy this temple and three days I will raise it up. And in the context, he's talking about destroy my body in three days, I will raise it up. And he did. Why is it important to remember that Jesus raised not just the widow's son? Why is it important to remember that Jesus raised not just the ruler's daughter? Why is it important to remember that he didn't just raise Lazarus from the dead? Why is it important that he raised himself with the authority of God the Father? It's important because of the sting of death. There was a really nice picture on that that did not come from my computer over onto this computer. So I apologize. It was a nice picture of a, I believe it was a bumblebee and, 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 or a scorpion, I can't remember which, with a stinger out. Only Jesus removes the sting, the sting of death. Why is it important to remember those things? The scorpion sting of death was removed by the resurrection of Jesus. None of the other resurrections, none of the other miracles, none of the other healings, none of the other exorcisms, none of the other multiplied loaves and fishes, none of the stilling of the waves, none of the casting of the, uh, uh, of the demons out, none of these things would do us any good 
if Jesus had not raised himself from the dead. Jesus came to us sovereign and sinless to take our place under the judgment of God. And why is that? Why is it that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the only resurrection that does any of us any good at all? It's not just because his resurrection was a one of a kind, which it was. It was an eternal resurrection. It was the divine son of God being raised from the dead. He was being raised with the authority of God and himself. That's one of a kind. Those things had never happened before. They have never happened since, and they will never happen again. That resurrection did everything it needed to do. But simply being one of a kind is not the way this resurrection makes all the difference in the world to us. You see, death was swallowed up. Did any of the pictures come through? All right. Death is swallowed up and believers have victory through Jesus. The reason this one of a kind death, excuse me, one of a kind resurrection makes all the difference in the world is because for us and for the world, it followed the crucifixion and it vindicated that one of a kind death. That one of a kind resurrection followed that one of a kind death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's how his death, that's how his resurrection is different from all those others. Lazarus being raised from the dead did not give us victory. Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead did not give us victory. Only Jesus being raised from the dead gives us victory. Because you see, sin condemns us all. Sin condemns us all. Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting is in death, Paul tells us in that context. The sting is now gone. And we ask that question, well, how can that be? The sting of death is sin. Paul will tell us in other contexts that the wages of sin is death, and that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us in here have sinned. And according to God's word, each and every one of us have died. But I look around, I see a lot of people breathing. I see a lot of people blinking eyes. I see a couple of people with eyes closed already taking a nap. That's not true. Our death is a spiritual death. When we sin, we die. We are taken out of the presence of God. We are no longer allowed in His presence on our own. And death, death is scary. Anyone who says differently, God help you and God bless you. While I am prepared for death, I do not long for death. I do not desire it. I want to keep it as far away from me as possible because there are so many things in this world selfishly I want to live for. There are so many things in this life that I selfishly want to see, that I want to experience. I'm 55 years old. The greater part of my life is probably over. I doubt I'm going to live to be 110 years old. But if I do, I hope and pray that every minute of that 110 years is giving praise and glory and honor to God our Father. But the few things that I want to see, I want to see my granddaughter grow up. I want to see her go to school that first day. I want to see her fall down and, and scrape her knee and, and come crying for grandma or come crying for grandpa or come crying for daddy, come crying for somebody. I want to see her mature into a lovely young woman. I want to see her at some point in her life, give her life over to Christ. I want to see her marry. I want to see or have children. I selflessly want to see those things. I want to see my wife's beautiful face for another 50 years at least. She may not want to see my old bald head, but that's okay too. You're stuck with that, darling. I want to see my sons grow into men that I know they can be. 
and I'm seeing them evolve now from their teens into their early 20s. I'm seeing them take more responsibility. I, I long, I desire to see them start to fulfill the things that God wants for them in their life. I want to see this congregation. I want to see the, the, the children and the grandchildren and, and visitors and all the people that we have here. I want to see your lives being enriched and being fulfilled by the love of God. I want to see the things in your life come to fruit. I want to see God working in your life. I want to see the Spirit working in your life, making you whole, bringing you peace. And we can't do that because this, this, this thing is in the way. Death is in the way. And so we, it scares me, and I want to push it away. Because you see, death is not a little bee sting, though it could be for those of us who have allergies. Death is that scorpion sting that kills us. And that's a scary reality, death. All of that leads up to the reality. It's leading up to the discovery that the death of Jesus was a one of a kind. And it turns his resurrection into an event that makes the difference for all of us. Paul says, oh, death, where's your sting? It's gone. Death, where's your victory? It's gone. He says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord, Jesus Christ. It sums up that great saving miracle of Jesus' one of a kind death. Jesus had existed from all eternity. He existed in perfect unity with God the Father, God the Spirit. If you'll read over in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived here as God and man. One person, two natures, divine and human. And he did that for about 33 years. And he never sinned. He never sinned. We can't say that. Jesus alone can say that. There is one human being and only one who did not deserve to die because he never sinned. I want to say that again. There has only been one human being and only one who did not deserve to die because he never sinned. And so we ask the question, well, then why did he die? Because God's purpose from the beginning of time, as we've read in Genesis through Revelation, when he created man, he said, I know they're going to fall. I know they're going to be need, to need to be redeemed. They're going to need to be brought back. And someone is going to have to go and do that. And Jesus volunteered, I'll go. I'll do it. John tells us again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Why did God do this for mankind? Because he loves us. How many of us would not lay down our lives for our own children? or for those that mean the most to us. There's not a single one of us in here who doesn't have somebody we wouldn't take a bullet for. Somebody in here that we wouldn't lay down, I will take your place. You need, somebody needs to die, you take me, let them go. Rarely, Paul tells us in Romans, will somebody do that for a good person. But while we were enemies, while we were God's enemies, after we had sinned, in our sin, during our sin, before, during, and after all of our sin, God said, through Jesus, I'll die for your enemies. While we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Read that again. God shows his love for us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. The Apostle Peter put it like this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, 
And 700 years before the time of Jesus, Isaiah wrote this. We've been studying this for the last six weeks. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We turn everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus came sovereign and sinless to take our place under the judgment of God. It was the most amazing and precious exchange that has ever been made. Paul says it like this, and Mr. Mike brought this up in our time of communion. God made him who had no sin to be sin. For us. The one who had never sinned chose to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so Paul asked that question, oh death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? It's gone. Death, you have no victory over me. None. Our sin brings death. And against all odds, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit have brought life. God's law says when we sin, we die. 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 God brings us life. God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. The law could not save us. The law is perfect, but the law is not designed to save. The law is designed to show you what you've done wrong. It's designed to show you what to do right. That's what the law, the perfect law of God is designed to do. And Jesus came and lived that law perfectly. And so on that cross, as he's hanging there, God put our sin, the death that we deserve, put that on the son. And that's a tragic story. But he didn't stay dead. And that's the great story. By his power, by God's power, by the power of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, raised to give us newness of life, raised so that we are no longer condemned, so that we no longer have to fear death. We may not want it. We may not look forward to it. We may, not try, to push, we may try to push it away, but we don't have to fear it. We are no longer condemned. God's Word tells us that now, when you physically die, you get to be rewarded. You get to come home. You get to wear a crown. You get to walk on a street of gold. You get to hang out with the angels. You get to sing with the people who've gone before you. You get to rejoice, and you get to, you get to worship and see God face to face because of what Jesus did, because of the resurrection, because of Him bringing, coming back to life. As Isaiah said, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life. He will be satisfied. We get to see the light of life. God executed the law's just sentence in the flesh, in Jesus' sinless flesh. It was our sin that put him there. It was our sin that condemned him on that day. And it is God's righteousness and just act to raise him from the dead. Jesus' just and righteous act was to be raised from the dead. And because of that, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We sing a song, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I cannot pay. Jesus said, I will pay your debt. Remember, the wages of sin is death. We owe a debt to God. Our sin is a debt to Him. And Jesus says, I'll pay your debt. 
He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live again. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He's not talking about our physical death. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all going to physically die. That's just the way of it. He who believes in me shall never die. And he asked Mary and Martha and Mary, do you believe this? And so I'll leave you with that question this morning. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus' death carried your sins? And do you believe that his resurrection brings you hope and a promise of eternal life in heaven? Well, if I'd seen it, I'd believe. If I'd been there, I'd, I'd have believed. Let me tell you a little story. Sometime after that, Lazarus was raised from the dead. Jesus is meeting at his house. It's the last week before his crucifixion. And he's sitting at dinner, and across from him is Lazarus, this guy he had raised from the dead. And remember, Lazarus had been dead four days. He was good and dead. He wasn't just dead. He was good and dead. That's a German word if you didn't know. And they're reclined around the table and they're eating supper with Lazarus and Lazarus is yucking it up and they're laughing and cheering and they're eating and they're having fun and they're having great discussion. And Mary comes out and brings some perfumes that are supposed to be saved for her wedding. She breaks them open and she pours them on Jesus' feet and pours and anoints his body. And Judas... Who was Judas, by the way? An apostle. Had been with Jesus from the beginning. Had seen every one of those miracles. Had seen him walk on water. Had seen him still the storm. Had seen him raise the dead. Had seen him feed thousands of people. Judas is standing right there, knowing, right across the, seat, the, the, the table from Lazarus. There's a dead man right over there. Jesus has got to be the Son of God. He's got to be special and powerful. No, Judas says, you know what? This is an outrage. We could have sold that for 300 denarii. We could have sold that for a year's worth of wages. Jesus told him, basically, shut up. He wasn't as harsh as I was in that, but that's what the word mean there. Be quiet. Leave her alone. What she does now, she prepares me for my burial. She's doing it out of love. She's doing it out of recognition of who I am. She knows that I am the Son of God. She knows that I will be resurrected, and she knows that she will have eternal life. And Judas, who witnessed the very same thing, is concerned about money. So don't sit here and think, well, if I'd been there, I'd believe. Exactly. You see, it comes down to this. Who do you love the most? Do you love yourself the most? Do you love your money the most? Do you love your job the most? Do you love things of this world the most? Do you love your selfishness and the things that you desire the most? Or do you, do you love Jesus the most? Mary, Mary loved Jesus the most. And she showed him that. And Judas loved himself the most, and he showed all of us that. You'll never deny Jesus because you lack sufficient evidence that he's glorious and beautiful. You'll never do that. He is glorious. He is beautiful. There's evidence of who he is. You'll only deny him because of yourself, because you love something else more than you love Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. If you don't believe in Jesus, if he is not your trusted Savior, if he is not your reliable leader, if he is not your precious treasure, again, it's not because you lack evidence. It's because, it's because your heart is not in the right place. 
because you love something more. This morning, believers around the globe, around the world, are gathering. People just like you, people just like me, gathering around the world, giving glory to God because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Next week, how many of them will come back and proclaim to the world again how much I love Jesus? I don't sit in judgment of them because I was then. I sit in sadness for them, knowing that they love something more than they love Jesus. Some days I still struggle with that, as I suppose most of you do as well. That's the way of our life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, against all odds, when you die, you will have life. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. Are you alive this morning? Are you alive in Christ? And if you are not, do you want to be? You put your faith, your confidence, your trust in who Jesus is, the Son of God, Savior of the world, the one who died with your sins on himself on the cross, the one who was raised three days later by the glory of God, power of God and bring us new life. And that new life awaits you this morning. You put your faith in Him. Confess Him as your Lord and your Savior. Have your sins washed away in immersion. As we talk to our brother Sean Thursday, be commissioned to tell everyone that you know who Jesus is and what He's done for you. If you have a need to respond to Jesus Christ this morning, to God's Word, we invite you forward as we stand and as we sing. I believe Mike has a good song picked up for us.